Next up in our discussion is uh, applying a function over a collection. So often we want to do an operation on multiple objects in a collection. So for example, if we wanted all the power from two to one, uh, of two from one to ten, uh, we would like to be able to get all of those powers. And in R, R is often a vectorized language. It's working generally with collections of objects. So it's often quite easy to do such operations. So for example, oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, we need to wrap that in parentheses. Okay, there we go. Uh, so it's often quite easy to do. Uh, it's quite, often quite easy to get um, the result when you apply some operation over a collection. And uh, very similarly uh, with square root. If we want the square root of numbers between 0 and 1 incrementing by 0.1, it's quite easy to do because many of the operations that are doing what you want to do are vectorized. Uh, mean, and by by the word vectorized, I mean they take they can take a vector as an input and return a vector as an output, where the output vector is the result of applying what you view as the basic operation with each of the elements. Uh, so now that said, it may not always be that simple so for example i'm going to load in the mass library and create a subset of the cars 93 data set which is in that library here's the the uh, head of that uh, data set we might in this case want the mean of every variable in this data set the thing though is the mean function is not ready to take in a data frame which so data frames can be viewed as lists of variables, each of which have a common uh, a common length. So uh, we are in effect applying a function over a collection because we want to apply the mean function over every variable or every column in the data frame. And unfortunately, the mean function is not out of the box equipped to do that. Yeah, it just fails. So we need to figure out a way to get the mean of every variable in this data set, and a temptation is to use a for loop. Here's what using a for loop would look like. Uh, first, I'm going to create an empty vector, a vector that has nothing in it, just just, just, just uh, to have a, just for our own curiosity, ha let's have a look at what this looks like. Yeah, it has nothing in it, but it is a vector, so if we were to ask is that vector uh, c dat means yeah oh hmm interesting it doesn't even uh recognize it as a vector that's kind of funny well anyway uh the code below still should work um anyway uh so for vec in cdat so here's the syntax for a for loop uh we have some vectorized uh, some vector like or list like object in this case cdat which is a data frame and it has, uh, let's do strcdat. Uh, if we look at this, there's some collection of objects in it, uh, which are collections of variables. And, uh, and uh, so what this uh, syntax for vec and cdat means is vec is going to iterate over every variable in cdat. So it's going to start out with min price so at first, vec will be min price. Okay. So it starts out by being min price, and then in the next, so the and then everything inside of the loop will happen. Everything in the loop. So in this case, uh, we should view mean vec as uh, taking the mean of that uh, vector, and uh, so we take the mean of that vector and we're going to create a we're going to create another vector that contains well what we're actually doing is combining the cdat means vector uh, with uh, that mean so that we end up expanding our vector by one okay so in the end the new cdat means vector will be the original cdat means uh, means vector with an additional uh, entry. So, but whatever is inside of this for loop, whatever is in between 
whatever's in between these two curly braces uh, will be executed. And, and uh, we have this variable vec that we're kind of iterating over in the loop. So vec will be changing its value through the loop. Uh, it will be taking each one of these as a as its value at some point in the loop in order. So uh, if we were to run this code, what we end up seeing is uh, here is cdat means. Okay, so the first entry is going to be the mean of the min price variable, which if you're curious, we're, let's do mean uh, cdat uh, dollar uh, min dot price. Yeah, they're the same thing. So, yeah, that's that's uh, how the for loop is working. Your this ve this variable vec is taking each of the values in this uh, in, in uh, this uh, collection of objects in order, and you do an operation using that um, using that. So, there's a way actually to unwrap this for loop. Uh, how <clears throat> Excuse me. How you unwrap it is okay. So uh, c dat means will be c c dat means and then mean c dat dollar min dot price. All right. So that would be the first time this loop runs. Then the next time it, the loop runs, we will have instead uh, c dat dollar price. And uh, the third time it runs, it'll be uh, uh, it'll be so hold on, it'll be max price. And then the fourth time through the loop, it will be uh, the fourth time through the loop, it will be uh, mpg dot city, and and we'll just keep going on like this. So let's uh, clear out cdat means and just, I'm not going to do every single, um, I am not going to do every single uh, uh, element in this uh, list. So when we look at cdat means now, uh, you can see that it's the first four uh, entries of that vector that we had before. Uh, so, and if we were to keep going on with this process through every variable, we would end up with the original vector, right? So that's kind of a way to understand what that for loop is doing. You can generally unwrap for loops. There was actually a names operation at the end that I didn't do. Yeah, there we go. Um, oh, oops. Oh, I didn't clear out uh, see that means. So I needed to clear that out. So that's how a for loop works in R. And I went through all this work explaining it. And I'm going to tell you that most of the time you don't need this. I mean, sometimes you do need a for loop. Sometimes a for loop is unavoidable, especially for more recursive type operations where, uh, let's say you're trying to compute the Fibonacci sequence. If you're uh, familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, uh, computing the Fibonacci sequence is a highly recursive thing. So uh, in that situation, you definitely would need a for loop. But... In general, like this operation right here, we actually didn't need a for loop. And a for loop is both slower and an overcomplication. It's both, not only do we not get a performance boost, because in R, for loops are slow. In languages like C, C++, or Java, those compiled languages, for loops are quite fast. But interpreted languages, including R and Python, for loops are generally slow because there is a cost to be paid for these languages for these languages being as easy as they are and as interactive as they are. And one of the costs that you have to pay is slow for loops. So not only are they slow, it seems like, and not only are they slow, the more offensive feature of them is that they're difficult to understand. Uh, or at least not nearly as easy to understand as a much simpler operation that's using uh, it, uh, functions that iterate over collections such as s apply. Um, so let's see. Uh, I was saying something a second ago. Uh, what was I saying? I don't. I don't remember. 
but basically, there is an easier way to do this. There is a much easier way to do this. This is difficult to parse. You have to read what's inside of the for loop very carefully in order to understand what the for loop is doing and also construct objects in somewhat of a strange way. Whereas the idea of take the mean of every column of a data frame is much more straightforward than that and is actually more automatable, if that's the way you pronounce it, um, than the for loop suggests. So, uh, in fact, if we're going to use the function s apply, we could do, well, I actually have the, uh, I have the solution right here. s apply c dat mean. That's the same thing. That's actually much easier. <laughs> uh, considerably easier. Uh, because what s apply is doing is you give it some collection of objects. It could be a vector or a list like object and give it a function for the second entry and it will apply that function to every object in that collection which is what we were doing before but in a much cleaner syntax and with much less setup much less setup so you end up with something that's both easier to read easier to understand and easier to maintain uh, easier to change if you want to screw around like for example um, if I wanted to make it so that this was a standard deviation, I can change it like so. There we go. Standard deviation of every, uh, column in this data set. All right. So, uh, you should be using S apply and there's a, actually, there's a similar function called L apply. Uh, the difference between S apply and L apply is that L apply gives you a list instead. Uh, rather than a vector. That's really the only difference, though. Uh, although there are times when S apply might end up giving you a matrix or possibly a list because whatever you told it to S apply over uh, or whatever you told it to work with, whatever collection of information you gave it did not return, say, data that's in a common, uh, that's a common data type. So it's like, well, I can't make a vector out of this, so I'm just going to make a list. Um, so there are sometimes S apply returns lists too, but that probably suggests an error on your part. You should not have this. Uh, here's another example of using S apply. First, I create an even function. So even is a function that takes an input X. And what this function is supposed to do is return true if a number is even and uh, false if a number is odd. And we know when a, that a number is even if that number, when divided by two, has a remainder of zero. So this is the even function. So I could do even uh, one, uh, one is not even, even two is, uh, so two is even, so this returns true. Uh, let's suppose I want to check which numbers between one and 10 were even. I could use s apply, give it the vector consisting of numbers between one and 10, and the function that we're going to apply is the even function. All right, so I run this line and it, and it works. Now that said, actually this function is already vectorized. So if I were to do even uh, one through 10, it already works. And the reason why is because this operation right here, x, x mod two equals zero, that is a vectorized operation. So this thing's already vectorized, but you can imagine like if I really wanted to uh, just torture people, it's like, okay, this works with the first entry. Then it wouldn't be, then it wouldn't be vectorized anymore. Uh, it would not be vectorized anymore, so you would be forced to use s apply. Uh, an important, so a very common idiom when you're using these apply functions is to give the function what's known. Like you have to have for your second uh, input to this function a function, and sometimes there isn't an existing function that does what you want to do. Uh, in this case, we wrote an even function and called it even and passed it to s apply, but it's possible that such a function didn't exist, and it's possible that we don't ever plan on using that function outside of this uh, loop ever again. So what you can do instead is create what's known as an anonymous function. Uh, anonymous functions are functions with no name. Uh, they're created once, and they do their thing, and then they go away. So in this case, I created a function that takes vec as an input. Uh, I didn't bother to name it 
because you don't need to name it because it's an anonymous function. Uh, and this function is computing the range of a data set. Maybe you remember uh, me mentioning the range before where it's the maximum minus the minimum. So take the difference of the range of VEC that returns the statistical notion of range. Um, so that's all it's doing. It's going to return a scalar. Uh, maybe, but yeah, you just create this anonymous function that's going to do some operation once. So VEC is in this case, it's it's like VEC up here where it's going to be a stand-in for some column in this data frame, and you're going to be iterating over all the columns in the data frame. So if we apply this line, this is what we get for the range of these uh, variables. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, and I already mentioned what LApply is. LApply is SApply, but it returns lists. Uh, alternatively, if we ha already have a function and we know how that function works with objects X, we could vectorize the function right away. So we could vectorize our function F so that it can take um, lists or vectors as input and return uh, the vectorized operation as an output or the result of applying that function to each entry in the... Uh, in in this collection uh, uh, as an output uh, so for example we going back to that example where we want the mean of every variable in the cdat data set we could create a version of vmean using the vectorize function we take this function vectorizes other functions so this function takes a function as an input it takes a function as an input and returns a function as an output. So functions are definitely treated just like any other type of data in R. So this function, so the vectorized function, the term for such a function, by the way, is functional, takes a function as an input and returns a function as an output. So mean is a function and vmean is also a function. vmean is a version of mean that can take, um, collections of objects as inputs and return the result of applying uh, whatever we pass to vectorize to each of those elements as an output. So as an example, remember that mean cdat doesn't work because cdat, uh, because mean does not know how to work with a list like object or a data frame, but vmean cdat does work and it does what we want it to do because we've now taken the mean function and vectorized it. So this is, in effect, what vmean will do is compute the mean of each column of a data frame or each uh, uh, entry in a list. At, at just just uh, to demonstrate, we can, we can, in fact, work with lists. So I'm going to create a list. So this will be list. Uh, we've got a vector 1 through 10, a vector of 2 of uh, three numbers and a vector of other numbers. Uh, and these vectors are all of different length. So uh, we could do V mean L1 and it still works because it doesn't actually have to take data frames as the input. It just needs some sort of uh, iterable object. So list like objects. And that includes other vectors. Although I think that V mean, like I think this is technically legal. It's also super boring. So with lists, it's not working out very well, but <laughs> but yeah, uh, because the mean of five is five. So it's not quite doing what we want to do with vectors, but that's fine. We did not design this thing to work with vectors. Um, all right, suppose you have a data frame D, uh, which contains information from different samples representing different populations, and you wish to apply a function F uh, uh, to the data that's stored in D dollar X and D dollar Y, uh, and, and it determines which sample each row from the data set comes from. So uh, D dollar Y identifies, so D dollar X is data and D dollar Y identifies a sample from which the data came. There's actually, uh, well, let's look at the Iris data set. Uh, so Iris, so we have for the iris data set um we have a we have a column that uh, let's do let's work at the first few rows of iris so head iris okay so for the iris data set we have some variables sepal length sepal width petal length petal width but they're all from different samples 
for different species of flower and the species column tracks what sample the observation came from. So the observation that corresponds to row one, it tracks what date, what a sample it came from or what data set it came from. So maybe what we want in this setup is to compute the mean sepal length for each sample. If that's what we want to do, there is a function that is built for that called aggregate. So the aggregate function will, so remember in this context, X is the data for which you want to compute some statistic like the mean. Y is the identifier of uh, the sample. So in this situation, X would correspond to sepal length and Y would correspond to species. So you do aggregate X tilde Y. Um, the tilde, by the way, means that this part in here will be what's known in R as a formula. I'm not going to talk about formulas today in any depth, but just be aware of that. So you have aggregate X tilde Y. You give it the data set in which the data is stored. And finally, you give aggregate the function you wish to apply. So in our case, since we want the mean sepal length, F will be D, uh, uh, F will be mean, and D will be iris. So, in fact, that's exactly what uh, I said I was going to do. Uh, so when I do aggregate to this data set, I get uh, the, so for the, for the Satosa species, the mean sepal length is 5.006. For the Versicolor uh, data set, the sepal length is 5.936. And for the Virginica, the mean is 6.588. So that is the mean for each group. If, if we wanted to, uh, we could use, say, um, sub, let, let's do subset. This is showing an alternative way to kind of do the same thing, but with much more work. And it will work just for one species. So we'll do subset uh, iris um, uh, select equals sepal dot length and uh, subset equals species equals Satosa. All right. Um, and uh, I want this as a vector, so we'll just do dollar sepal dot length. So that treats it as a vector, and then I compute the mean. All right, so those two numbers, the number here and the number here agree. So that's suggesting that this is in fact doing what, what, what I suggested it's doing. It's just aggregate is much easier to write and use and understand. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, here is another example. We've switched out the uh, function that we're working with. We're no longer working with mean. Now we're working with the quantile function. And in this case, it's re it's returning the five number summary by default, the minimum, the maximum, first, third quartile, and the median. So quantile actually is vector valued. Now you get to see what aggregate does when uh, the function that you're applying to each sample is vector valued. It created a column uh, that would correspond to uh, each of the the different entries from the from from the vector value function. So, for example, for comparison, if I were to change this to quantile, this these are the corresponding quantiles for the Satosa flowers, and those numbers are agreeing with uh, what aggregate was getting us. So, there it is for comparison. Uh, now you can kind of see what's happening when you have a vector valued function uh, being passed to aggregate. All right, uh, matrices. Uh, when we have matrices, maybe we want to work with data inside of uh, matrices. Like, for example, uh, we have these tables that consist of uh, these uh, two way tables where we have different categories along columns and different categories along, along rows, and we can intersect. Uh, different variables to uh, determine how many people fell into a group. So, for example, the uh, the Titanic data set is in some way a four-way table because you can see it as this four-dimensional table um, and uh, it's containing counts for intersections of different uh, v uh, variable values. Um, how many observations fell into those groups? So, often we want to work both 
And we want to be able to work with uh, data that's in some matrix or array-like object. And for that, we can use the apply function. So a call to apply would be apply. Uh, we have the matrix that we're working with. Uh, we give it we give the function the index of the margin that we're going to work with. So I believe, if I remember, if I'm remembering right, that an m of one corresponds to rows working across rows, and an and an m of two corresponds to working across columns, and f is a function that we wish to apply to the rows or the columns. So mat is the matrix of data and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I was right when in saying that one is across rows, two is across columns. So here is an example. I, I hope this works because this is getting information off of the internet. Oh, those libraries aren't installed. So we need to install XML. Uh, I don't know, Texas, sure. <laughs> All right, so after I install this, this uh, this example, I hope it works. And the reason why I'm thinking it might not work is because we're getting information off of the internet and uh, we're downloading it directly from the internet. In fact, we're doing some uh, web scraping. Uh, web scraping is the process of getting data off of the internet when that data was not necessarily put in uh, a friendly format. Often that data is stored in uh, HTML. So it's like in an HTML table. Whenever you're looking at anything on the internet, uh, what you're seeing is, uh, all right, right, right. I need to install that package, so. So when you're looking at information on the internet, this is all HTML. It would be possible to look at the source HTML for this stuff. And the idea of web scraping is we're going to extract information from that HTML that, is, that isn't that is actually in a format that's very friendly to um, analysis like this and uh, make it work for us. But whenever you're working with data from the internet, the thing is that the internet is a very volatile place. So... Uh, formats change, uh, yeah, the data formats change, how they're displaying formats change, web pages change, the location of web pages change, and I wrote this these lecture notes in 2016, so this example might not work. Uh, so, uh, fingers crossed that uh, the state of Utah didn't change this web page. Okay. So far, so good. Uh, cannot find function get. Uh, oh, because I didn't load in these libraries. I installed them. <laughs> All right, let's try this. Did it work? Did it work? Did it work? Did it work? Cannot find function read HTML table. Uh, that might be because I didn't load this in either. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Did it work? Did it work? Did it work? Did it work? Come on, come on. Oh, yes, yes, all right, it worked. It still works. Uh, all right, so yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, that's that's really ugly, but it's fine. I'm not gonna bother to explain any of this code. I, If you wanna learn more about web scraping, go learn more about web scraping. Read the documentation for those packages, but I'm not, I'm not gonna bother, because uh, this is already complicated enough. All right, so. Um, uh, what we got? Ooh, what we got? Oh, yeah. I didn't even... Like, in the original le lecture notes, if you look at the original lecture notes, th I did not even bother to echo this. Like, I did not bother to display it because I don't want to explain it. So, uh, just take it for what it is. So, we got school, race dad. All right. It's in a nice, friendly uh, matrix. All right. So, we've got counts. Basically, this is how many Native American students are in Entheos Academy Kearns. This is how many Native Americans are in Entheos Academy Magna. This is how many Hispanic students are in Entheos Academy Kearns, Entheos Academy Magna. Uh, how many white students, uh, uh, students who identify as multiple races, and so on. 
So these are going to correspond to counts. So we might want, for example, how many Native Americans are in the sample, regardless of the school. Uh, how many Asians are in the sample, regardless of the school. How many students are there in Entheos Academy? How many students are there in Entheos Academy Magnus? So sometimes we want to apply an operation across rows, or sometimes we want to apply it across columns. So in this case, the operations that I've been mentioning are... Um, uh, like a summation operation. So let's suppose that I want the row sums where you get the sums um, uh, for each row. So that's something across. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, here, so in that case, the call is going to be apply school raised at. We do one because we were going down the row. So uh, index one corresponds to rows and sum because we're adding up everything in the rows. Uh, we could also do a similar thing for the columns. So that will get us the number of individuals who are in each school. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, Carpet Hills is still larger than Kearns. Now that said, for this example, this example is slightly silly because there's actually functions called row sums and call sums uh, that are basically doing the exact same thing, but they're easier to use because you don't have to use apply for them, but you get the idea, right? Uh, we could, if we wanted to, like we could switch out some for mean. Not that this makes any sense. It doesn't make sense to take uh, to take the mean like this. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the idea of the apply function. All right, so that's it for this video. Um, I believe that the next section is the last section for this lecture on using external data sets. All right then. I will see you there.